Today's video is brought to you by eWin Racing, the best source for gaming chairs and desks for those long gaming sessions. We have a playlist of our eWin chair and desk videos linked in the video description below. Save 30% off of everything using the discount code TECHDEALS. More details at the end of the video. Mike comes in with a question that honestly might be the first time we've ever been asked this question. But I think it's a good question to ask, and so... It is, what is the sign of a motherboard, not CPU, failure or about to fail? Well, I want to answer this question in two parts. First of all, thank you very much for the support, Mike, and thank you very much for the question. Regarding CPU failures, I have been in the PC business for a long, long time. I first got my personal PC in 1991, but I used PCs before that, and I had Apple II computers before that, but the first PC I personally owned was in 1991. I started my first PC company in 1996, and I've owned my own PC business for 25 years. In that time, I have built, upgraded, serviced, touched, seen, installed, and otherwise been around thousands and thousands of computers. I've long since lost count the number of computers that have waltzed in front of me at some point for some reason. Shuffle dance. <laughs> How many of those CPUs, Rogue, do you think have ever been defective? Zero? Maybe one? If I really struggled to think about it, I might find one or maybe two. I mean, I don't remember any in the last four years. CPU, if C CPUs are tested before they're shipped. Correct. They are also one of the most precisely manufactured thing in the most expensive factories on earth. And they're a sealed unit. So they're not, uh, it's not like a big motherboard with all those components that you're constantly touching. It's if, like- If anything, it'll be user failure getting thermal paste in the pins. Right. But once you get the CPU installed on the board and if it works, for five minutes. It's gonna work. It will work forever. So you can rule CPU out, is what you're saying. There, yes. There was a limited period of time 20 years ago when the Athlons- Well, he's not asking you about No, that. no, I know. <laughs> this is the long version. <laughs> there was a brief period before the integrated heat spreaders came out and AMD actually had exposed eyes where there was not the big heat spreader. Actually, you just had the thumbnail size chip and you'd put this big heat sink smaller than current ones, right on it, and you had to balance it. And if you screwed it down unevenly and it tilted, it actually could crack the die. But uh, that's operator error, that's not yeah, the fault. Yeah, but that's also engineering being an idiot designing something that wasn't right. It was a different time. They added integrated heat spreaders and that problem went away. But it's also worth noting that if you did that, it never worked at all. Once it was installed and running, they last forever. So, I want to bring that up because he mentioned CPUs and I want the audience to know that the odds of your CPU genuinely being defective is are almost zero. zero. It happens, but it usually happens due to overclocking, incorrectly setting voltages, power surges, that sort of thing. User error. And if you have enough of those problems to fry your CPU, the rest of your computer's toast too. <laughs> exactly. So it's like, oh, the lightning only struck the CPU. You used to, we have a problem. So putting those issues aside, I have had more problems with motherboards than almost anything else in my 25 years of doing this professionally and my 37 years of doing this for funsies. So the, the, I would say the number one component I've had problems with in all those years, RAM. Yeah, RAM. I've had more pro If I ever have a problem with the system, boom, first thing I do is I swap the RAM. I, that solves more headaches than anything else. Interestingly enough, hard drives. I've had tons of problems with hard drives over the years. We don't use hard drives anymore. Well, you shouldn't, except for mass storage archive for uh, cat videos. Yeah. Yes, but SSDs are stupid, unbelievably reliable, and so those generally aren't an issue either. But back when hard drives were common, um, back when I actually used to do support calls and I actually uh, did servicing of clients, replacing failed hard drives was a regular thing. Well, so much so that selling backup solutions was a good chunk of my business. That's not what he's asking about. He no. wants to know about motherboard failure. RAM, hard drives, and motherboards. Everything else for the most part 
it, if it works for five minutes, it lasts forever. Maybe not monitors, but that's not in your computer. Now, to answer his question about impending problems with motherboards. Yes. The single biggest thing that tells you you have a problem with your motherboard, assuming it's not corrupted drivers, assuming it's not a bad Windows install, assuming you didn't try to migrate a Windows install between Intel and AMD or five up upgrades and generations and other nonsense, assuming, assuming it isn't a software issue, a blue screen of death in Windows is either a RAM problem or a motherboard problem. The RAM problem takes three seconds to find out. Ding, ding, chick, put them in. Do we have a problem? Does it run? If it does, you're fine. If it doesn't, what really sucks is usually the next step is the motherboard. And changing motherboards, it can be a pain because if you don't have the exact same one, all the cables are in a different spot. If you have the zip tied, it's a pain in the neck. Um, having a problem in Windows, having a crash, having a blue screen, motherboards. Now, you can, of course, test this by making sure your BIOS is up to date. Uh, one thing that I'll do before I swap out a motherboard, because it, changing on a motherboard is a big fat pain in the butt, is I will take the boot drive off, and thankfully with the new M.2 NVMe sticks, yeah. it's really easy. I'll take the drive off, I'll go grab a spare NVMe, stick it on there, and do a quick clean install of Windows 10, which again, thankfully, is really quick. Doing this years ago was a pain in the butt, but it's so fast today. I'll do a clean install of Windows, and then I'll run an 8064 stress test on the memory, motherboard, CPU, cache, etc. If it does that for 20 minutes, and I don't get any problems, then maybe the Windows install is borked. If I still run into crashes and problems, and I've already changed the RAM, it's probably your motherboard. Another indicator that your motherboard is having issues is uh, random shutdowns. If you're, mach if you're using your computer and your system just shuts down. shuts down. Now that might be the power supply. It could be. But so it also could be your motherboard. Generally, RAM and video cards and CPUs is not going to cause your machine to shut down. It's going to be power supply or motherboard. Another thing that will tell you is if you have devices that don't work, like on the back plane, like if you've got USB ports that don't work, like mm -hmm. some of your USB ports work, and but some, some don't. don't. Or if you've got intermittent connections where you have to like jiggle the cables constantly or you have to unplug it, replug it. Now, here's the thing. You need to verify that what you're using actually works in another machine. Like if I have USB keyboards that are intermittent on all my computers. That's the keyboard's fault, not the computer's fault. But if you have a keyboard or you have a networking device or you have a cable, or you have something that's plugged into your computer and it just drops offline and then kicks back on. And if you take it off and put it on a known working machine and it works perfectly, your computer. And since all those ports and all those connections and all those things run through all those traces on your motherboard, motherboard. But don't some of the motherboards have the, the digital number on them to tell you what's wrong? Not all of them do, but some. They do, but intermittent problems. Won't tell you that. No, the, uh, the, the number on there is generally boot problems. It's like if your system isn't booting because the RAM's not recognized, it'll give you a RAM code. Or if the video card's not initializing, it'll give you a video card code. But once you're booted into Windows, that generally doesn't tell you very much. Oh. Also, some motherboard companies provide lousy documentation. I cannot tell you the number of times I have booted a system up, it doesn't boot, and there's an error code on the two-digit display. I open the motherboard manual. And there's no code. And it's not in the list. Many times. I don't want to say the motherboard companies do shoddy work, but uh, motherboards are my least favorite part of this business. I really wish motherboards were done differently, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so basically, after troubleshooting... Intermittent device connections, random shutdowns, black, uh, blue, sc I black screens, blue screens, those are sort of the things that say, hey, you've got a problem. And all of those have symptoms. Because if you're just using your computer and everything's working and you're not doing anything different, then nothing's warning you that your motherboard's gonna go bad. It, it works. Correct. And it works until it doesn't. Motherboards also will be the thing that ages worst, or I should say, least gracefully on your computer. I've got 10-year-old machines where everything in the computer is fine except the motherboard. Uh, either they don't hold the overclock they used to. My i7 
2600 K on my Z68 Asus motherboard. Um, it is a pain because on that motherboard, you turn it on, it starts to boot and it hangs. You kill the manual power switch in the back, you wait 10 seconds and you turn it on and you boot again. It gets further, but then it hangs. Then you hit the reset switch on the front of the computer and then it boots and it's consistent. That motherboard used to work great, but at some point it got fussy. I've changed power supplies. I've changed the CPU. I used to have an i5 in there. I've got an i7. RAM's changed, graphics cards changed. Every single component on that machine has been changed except the motherboard. Sorry. That motherboard is 10 years old mm -hmm. and it's been moved between machines and it's been tinkered with and played with. And I, now, I have not tried another Z68 motherboard, but I've changed every other part, including the power supply. So it's the motherboard. There you go. Now, is, is this helpful to Mike? Does this answer the question? I don't know. I hope that this sort of exploration of the challenges is helpful to somebody watching. Uh, this is where spare parts come in really handy because if you have no spares. Rogue's favorite. favorite it is your favorite, favorite bit. Spare parts. Well, it's not just that you need spare motherboards, but if your system is acting funny and it's not trying to be a stand-up comedian on the weekend, <laughs> then swapping out RAM, putting in a different video card, uh, changing the easy stuff, grab a different keyboard and mouse, try those. Grab a different network cable. Do you have, do you have another HDMI cable? For your monitor, try a different cable. Try the display ports. Yep. Do you have a different video card? Those are all five-minute changes. You can swap all those things quickly. Correct. Even if you have a identical replacement motherboard, you're looking at one to two hours of pain in the butt changing everything. And here's what's really bad. If you have another motherboard that is not the same, if it's the same chipset, you can swap it over and keep your Windows install. But... The cables may not be in the same place. The front panel connectors, the yep. USB internal header, the 24 pin ATX connector, instead of being up here, it's down here. And if you've got all your cables laid out in your system, you cannot just change the board without opening the back, cutting all the zip ties and rewiring it. It sucks and I've done it. And you know what's worse? Change the board, do all of that, and it doesn't fix the problem. <laughs> I've had it happen. I've had it happen, and it's just, um, I can actually tell you, there was actually a client, back when I did consulting for companies, we had a client who had, oh, maybe 15 computers in their office, and they had one computer that was fussy. The other machines were fine. I'd been down like two or three times to do something. It, it, it had corrupted files. It had blue screen. I changed, I came down, I changed the network card. Right. This is back when you actually put network cards in machines. Yes. I changed the drive out. I reinstalled Windows on it. I, I did a variety of things to it. You know what I did on my third trip? I bought a, I brought a new computer with me and I set it down and I took the old computer and I said, have at it. You know what? They didn't call me again. Oh, there we go. Well, about that. Yeah, about that. You know, I took the old machine back to the office, yeah. took it apart and said, you're done. <laughs> Take, Screw you. You computer. aren't where it was like a $600 computer. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not even I just it. took all the parts out, stuck them on the shelf and said, this computer just hates me. Um, that actually was the event that caused me to change my policies for companies that had multi seats like that. Um, I remember we did one job for, for, for us, a large company, a small company by all things perspective. They had about 25 people in the office. And they needed 25 computers. And so when we sat down and priced everything out, I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to get 27 computers. Yeah, so you got spares. And we're going to configure one of these machines as a generic spare. And it's going to go over there in the closet. Because if you call me up and you have a problem, the first thing I'm going to say to you is, go grab that other computer and put it there so your employee can work. And that way I can just come in tomorrow and just look at it. I'm, don't brush me on this. Um, and I actually talked them into taking the other spare and setting up a desk that was nobody's. But so it's sitting there. Yeah, so it's just... I said, look, if you ever have a problem, first things first, go walk over to the other machine and try to do what you're doing. Printing, whatever. 
you're paying these people to work. Yeah. And if they're sitting there with their computer and it's having a problem. They're not working. The cost, if you've got the money for 25 employees and 4,000 square feet of commercial office space and hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy all these computers, you can afford to spend two grand to buy two more computers to make this problem go away. Yeah. And after that, I made that sort of a standard procedure. I said, this is a colossal waste of everyone's time to futz about with this stuff. Correct. The other thing I learned is the people who balked at spending that money were going to be the biggest pain in the butt customers you ever found. Charge them double. I actually, it took me, it took me 10 years to learn how to fire customers. The ones who were, who ate up all of your time and who were always a problem. And those people also always wanted the cheapest prices. 80-20 rule. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> At some point it's like, look, you know what? Um, tell you what, why don't you try to do it yourself for a month and see how that works? Oh, you know what? Most of our business was from people calling up who... What was happening is Bob, who was the accountant or who was somebody in the office, was the internal IT guy. It wasn't a full-time job. They might have 10 employees. We did a lot of offices with like 10 employees. Because when you have five, Bob would handle it. You just have five personal computers, no big deal. Once you get to an office of 10 or 12 people, now you want a server, now you want a printer to everything. Um, Bob could no longer handle it. Yeah. And that's when we'd get a call. And that's when I'd say, okay, now it's time to spend some money. And they would never like to hear the number. But, you know. You're going to deal in PCs? Got to have the moolah. Kind of a segue off of motherboards. But I hope that was interesting and informative to some of you. Ewin Racing has a wide selection of chairs to fit all shapes and sizes of gamers, ranging from petite to cuddly, they have something for every type of gamer. Not just sizes, but colors and material options as well, including red, blue, purple, pink, orange, and more, plus cloth and leather choices. We have over half a dozen chair and desk videos in a playlist down in the video description below. We also have a very special offer just for Tech Deals viewers. Save 30% off of everything using discount code tech deals using our link in the video description. We have used eWin gaming chairs for three years in our office, sitting on them for up to eight hour marathon live streams. They are very comfortable and we are happy to work with eWin to bring you this special discount and recommend eWin for all of your gaming chair and desk needs.